Well, hello there, listeners. It's Susie New here, immediate past president of the Australian Society of Anesthetists, and welcome to our podcast. It's called Australian Anesthesia, and it's about all things relevant to anesthesia in Australia. In this episode, I'm sharing with you a talk that I gave recently at a department dinner. Not only was it just a department, but it was the anesthesia department where I did almost all of my anesthesia training. So it was wonderful, of course, to be back with familiar faces and many of the specialists and mentors that I looked up to as a registrar. The host of the dinner suggested that I record this as a podcast, so I hope you enjoy this story. I'm calling it a story, I suppose. It's my story, it's my journey, my path, or elements of it, into becoming the ASA president and my reflections of the role, and also flagging some of the work that we're hoping to do in the ASA. As I said, it was great being back amongst peers, mentors, supervisors. I was really, really warmly welcomed. And so in starting my talk, I recalled one of the great traditions of this department, which was an annual end of year run. So before I go into that, I want to pause and ask, do you, in your anesthesia department or your private practice group, have a regular tradition that you do? Something outside of work that is a regular event in your calendar that brings you together for some social time and to do all those things that are great events and great traditions. Because speaking of traditions, I believe we have a role in honouring the past. But we also have a duty to question the way things are done and even be prepared to buck the system. In particular, I believe it is time to look at meaningful, tangible ways we can improve diversity and inclusion in healthcare and in this country. How did I come to form this belief? Well, up until recently, I was the president of the Australian Society of Anesthetists. I've been told, in fact, that I have the honour of being the longest serving president of the society. When I first joined the various committees of the ASA, I never imagined that one day I would become president. So, can you imagine? I've flown to Sydney to attend my first ever board meeting. We're in the ASA boardroom at ASA headquarters. It's a very stately room surrounded by awards boards. All these honoured anaesthetists have their names beautifully painted on them. You walk into the room after walking past photos of all the past presidents. Most of them are in black and white. And then through the library, which has all of the historic books. The then president, David M. Scott, came up to me, welcomed me, started chatting and making me feel welcome. And then he also said, now, Suze, you can be president of the society one day. And before I could say anything else, I blurt out, "Uh, no, I don't think so. It was all I could say with all of that noise going on in my head. You know, that chatter that's wondering, have I worn the right dress? Will my feet last all day in these heels? Please don't choke on this cup of tea while talking to the president. Do you know that voice? Later I learned that it was my imposter syndrome voice. The one that ultimately, at its very core, says, you don't belong here. Fast forward from that first board meeting to a few years later. I was asked a number of times to nominate for vice president and I declined. Can I add here that all of these supporters who asked me to nominate are white men? You guys really aren't so bad after all, and I'd love to see more of the same. Within the ASA, the role of vice president is seen as a stepping stone to becoming president. It's usually two years in one role and then two years in the next. In those very early days, being president, to me, just seemed like doing more of the same in terms of what I'd already been doing within the ASA. Chairing more committees, being on more committees, basically doing more committee work. As anyone who's been in a leadership position knows, that is only partially true. There were three things that ultimately led me to saying yes. First, it was the support of my family. All the meetings, the late nights, the travel. I could not have done it without the support of my wonderful husband and our daughter, who is quite the unicorn. The other one was that a colleague, this time a woman, said, sometimes these opportunities present themselves once and may never come around again. 
Now, she is an incredibly intelligent, humble woman. She's also led quite a few anesthesia departments. And I thought she would support my decision to say no. Even though there'd been men encouraging me to nominate, hearing it from a woman meant I heard, I belong. This opportunity belongs to me. The final bit of encouragement was via my dad, who is a big supporter of mine, and he simply asked me how long the term would be for. In explaining it to him, an outsider to the world of medical politics, I realised that during a typical 30-40 year career span of an anaesthetist from training through to retirement, there would be only 15, maybe 20 ASA presidents and that this was actually an incredibly unique opportunity and it might involve more than just doing more committee work. So I agreed to be nominated for vice president and I was successfully voted in at the next AGM. Once I knew what was coming, I began preparing. I learned more about leadership, governance, strategic thinking. I also started to read about the history of the ASA in order to better understand our values and so I could keep building and clarifying my vision for the society and where I could lead it. But then I found, after a few short months, I had to take on the role of acting president. Coincidentally, I had a colleague at the time who was going through a similar thing within her department of anaesthesia and we both lamented that the words sudden and acting in relation to a new role, will never really be able to fully convey the circumstances that led up to that situation. My husband is an overwhelmingly positive person, and he sums it up as the worst Christmas ever. I remember after becoming acting president, the first phone call I had with our CEO, Mark Carmichael. I really struggled to say the P word. I think the sentence went something like, So now that I'm um, uh, heading up the society, I suppose it should be me calling so-and-so. And And that so-and-so happened to be the president of another medical society. Now, Mark is an incredibly supportive and able CEO, and he picked up on it straight away. He reassured me, yep, you're the president, and it's well within your rights to pick up that phone and speak with the other presidents. So with that, I found my mantra when it comes to leading and speaking up. If not me, then who? I belong here. I was still incredibly nervous the first time I picked up the phone and spoke with a CEO that I had barely met. The Susie knew in my head didn't play on this field and at this level. There was my imposter voice. But every time I spoke with a CEO, a president, a health minister, I was met with warmth and respect and gratitude that the ASA president had time and had reached out to them. If not me, then who? I belong here. Another significant moment for me was on the eve of being formally voted in by the ASA membership as the ASA president. The presidential clock would start again and I would lead the ASA for a further two years. I had by that stage already been leading the ASA for the better part of a year. A colleague came up to me and asked me a really simple question. So, Suze, what number female president will you be? Can you imagine I'd been in the role for that long and I had no idea? I had been reading the ASA's history and not once did I think to read this history with regard to the women of the ASA. So there you go. We all have unconscious biases. This inspired a new way of looking at the ASA and at my role. And if you want to know more about the four women presidents who came before me and the role of women in the ASA, then I invite you to watch my Jeffrey K. Oration. I'll put a link to it in the episode notes, but if you search on YouTube, you'll find it on the ASA YouTube channel, as well as a link to it from my own YouTube channel. Yes, I have my own YouTube channel. Now, speaking of YouTube, did you know that YouTube is the third largest search engine? Do you know what it comes after? Google, no prizes there. But do you know what has recently jumped from third to second in terms of most popular search engine? Amazon. There you go. Thank you, online shopping. Anyway, how do I know that? How do I know what search engines are most popular? Well, because my journey as ASA president involved me becoming a podcaster, and here we are. So how did someone who would usually shy away from media start learning to broadcast my voice. 
Coming into the ASA Vice Presidency, I knew that the ASA produces a regular e-newsletter. Part of my vision was to share what the ASA does with everyone around me. I could see that the ASA is so busy. We do so much. There's all the advocacy, the educational events, the informal peer support that we offer. And I wanted to share all of these activities with anaesthetists, trainees, anyone who is team anaesthesia. I also realised that there's a lot of decisions that we make around the board and council table that are based on sometimes nuanced, other times robust discussions. And I wanted to be able to share some of the reasoning behind some of those decisions. So when we started putting all of those activities into a newsletter, it was huge. We'd been donating money to Lifebox, an initiative that provides oximeters to anaesthetists in lower middle income countries and something that I'm really passionate about. We'd met with the Department of Health about the MBS review. Anesthesia and Intensive Care, the scientific journal that we produce, was going online. And congratulations to our members who've received Australian honours. And so on and so on. And so for the sake of everyone's attention spam, we had to limit each news item to just a few sentences. I had been talking with David Kibblewhite, who was president of the New Zealand Society of Anesthetists at the time. And he too recognised the challenge of keeping people up to date and so, had been doing what a lot of people were doing, started writing a president's blog. I thought this was a great idea and something I wanted to do as well. But when I went to write my first blog, I just had complete writer's block. I wanted to sound intelligent, profound, perhaps a little bit funny, put a lot of pressure on myself. But there was nothing. In the meantime, Paul Singh, our IT manager, had been building a web page to house this magnificent blog. And he kept asking me, so where is it? When I finally explained, I just struggled to write anything. He said, why don't you do a podcast? Just get your phone out and press record. So that's exactly what I did. I sat down with Mark Sinclair, who our regular listeners will be no stranger to. At the time, he was chair of one of our major committees, and we recorded a podcast. And I really love that first episode. It's only available to ASA members. I'll put a link to it in the show note. But episode number one. It was recorded in the ASA library with my laptop sitting between the two of us. The only editing I did was to remove the part when one of the staff members knocks on the door and comes in to check that we're okay. There's basically no sound production, no editing of the content, and I really love it because it shows how far this podcast has come. I found podcasting, especially during that long lockdown we had in Melbourne, a great way to connect with people. It's not often you get a chance to chat with someone for an hour or so and really listen to what they have to say. Also through podcasting, I've joined a global community and met some really talented people from all walks of life and learnt things like which are the most popular search engines. At one point, I was asked by another community member, what is the goal of the podcast? Simple. To showcase the work of the ASA, the talents of anaesthetists, and particularly share women's voices. And there's been no shortage of inspiring, impressive women to invite to the podcast for a chat. I've been in good company, or as my five-year-old daughter pronounces it, company. Now, I'm a little bit guilty of not correcting her pronunciation of the word because I really like it. To me, it's a combination of comfort and company. Being the sole woman in the room means you stand out. You tend to be more heavily scrutinised. People might think that you're there just to fulfil a quota or some other tokenistic reason. Sometimes you might be asked, what do women think about this particular question? I would never say it, but in my head, the answer went something like, well, I'm not sure what all women would think about this, but for a woman of Cambodian heritage who was born in the Philippines and migrated to Australia as a baby and then grew up in Canberra and then went to medical school in Melbourne, but then also has an interest in global health, then their view might be, it can be a lot of pressure to think that you have to represent the views of everyone in whichever group that you're labelled as belonging in. That can be even more so if you're more than one only, like you're the only woman, the only Asian, the only anaesthetist in a room full of surgeons, the only doctor in a meeting with bureaucrats and health executives. When I was in those situations, I remembered my mantra, if not me, then who? I might be the only woman, 
but I'm also the only president of the ASA. And I know I have come to this meeting with the full support of our council and members. If not me, then who? Bring it on. I belong. Maybe, however, we just need more than one woman in the room. Having two women in the room may mean that they can lend support to each other's initiatives, boost each other's ideas. Yet even with two women, they may still be seen as a minority interest. I recall one piece of advice, which was, if I'm one of two women, then don't sit with the other woman, as we may be seen by the men as to be forming some sort of female conspiracy. Can you imagine a man or have you as a man ever received that sort of advice? Thank goodness for Zoom meetings where you can sit virtually wherever you want. Research has shown that it takes three women on a board to start having an impact. Three women at the table starts to positively impact a whole range of board decisions, and it also starts to create cultural change. It's good company, and it's good for companies. So, in summary, I'd like to leave you with these three things from my story. First, women belong. Also, Indigenous, people of colour, LGBTQIA belong at all levels, particularly those where decisions are being made. Second, we have a voice that should be heard. If you want to hear more, listen to more episodes of this podcast. There's plenty of inspiring women here. Watch my Jeffrey K. oration. And finally, decision makers deserve company. If you are privileged, and it is a real privilege to be in this position, then aim for at least three. Three women on a board, a committee, a panel. I ask you to consider this next time it comes up within your sphere of influence or your vote. I ask you to amplify. Because if not you, then who? So there you have it. My story, my talk, my message, my call to action. If this inspires you in some way, then there may be some opportunity for you to get involved. We're very proud to be partnering with the Society of Pediatric Anesthesia in the US, who've developed a program called WELLI, which stands for the Women's Empowerment Leadership Initiative. It's still very early days, but at some stage in the future, we hope to be looking for men and women who are interested in helping amplify. It's a process we'll all go through together. Sometimes people don't feel like they're the natural leader, the natural head of their field in order to embark on this. There's plenty of support, coaching, mentoring, not just for those women who are hoping to meet their career goals, but also for the men and women who will act as their advisors. As I said, it's still very early days. We are planning to work with the college, with Spencer and with the New Zealand Society of Anesthetists on this. So I do hope that however you get your information about anesthesia in the region, you'll get to find out about this loud and clear. You belong, you have a voice, you have an opportunity to amplify. All right, in the meantime, thanks for listening and hope you stay safe out there. This episode of the Australian Anesthesia Podcast was produced by the Australian Society of Anesthetists, otherwise known as the ASA. More episodes can be found on the ASA website, theasa.org.au. Don't forget to follow or subscribe to receive the latest episodes, and of course, you're welcome to share them as widely as you wish. Please send any feedback to the ASA by emailing asa at asa.org.au. Music was by Mark Suss, and we hope you enjoyed listening.